Good evening, good evening, and welcome to Operation Life Back to the Basics. Um, this is a series that we have been producing here on blackdoctors.org, talking about those conditions that significantly or disproportionately impact black and brown communities. And so we have done, if you go look on our YouTube page, we've got a whole playlist dedicated to all of the different shows we've done. Uh, hypertension, we did cholesterol, we did diabetes, we did prostate cancer, uh, heart attack, what to do if you had a heart attack. So really we've done about a really great series of videos. And so tonight, what we're gonna be talking about is art, some something that really impacts black people, but not too much to the point of death, but something that is very, very important to us. And that is our skin and our hair. And so we have a wonderful, wonderful guest that uh, is a friend of the program and you will see her uh, today and in upcoming weeks, we've got Dr. Brooke Jackson uh, that's gonna be coming on with us. But before we get started with you, Dr. Jackson, I got a couple of uh, instructions for our audience. Let us know where you're watching from, drop it in the comment section, let us know. We'd like to know where people are watching from all over the country. Also, if this is some information that you think will be good for your friend or your mom or your cousin or somebody in your family that needs this information, tag them, share it with the friend so they can get this wonderful information too. And finally, if you have any questions, make sure you drop those in the comment section. We love to answer your questions because we want to make sure that we're getting all of your questions and your needs answered. So I think that's all the housekeeping. Welcome, Dr. Jackson. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I, I, I Look, as you can tell, um, you and I should have had this conversation a long time ago, yeah. but <laughs> be that as it may, um, is it just hereditary? Is it stress? What causes, because I, I saw the statistic that they said up to a third or a half of Black women suffer some amount of hair loss in their lifetime. That's a lot. So what is the reasoning? What What's going on? And why is all that happening? Yeah. So thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and share this information because these are really conversations that I have every day with patients. Um, I have a dedicated hair loss clinic. And in the beginning of COVID, I told my staff three months later after um, COVID, everyone, everything shut down, hair loss clinic was going to be ridiculously busy and it has been nonstop for a year and a half and I will share with you why. So the medical term for hair loss is called alopecia. It means the same thing. Hair loss means alopecia, but there are many different types of alopecia. And so generally we divide alopecia into two broad categories, scarring and non-scarring. And there are lots of reasons for both. And so when somebody says I have hair loss, like, okay, well, it's like saying you have a car, what kind of car do you have? Because they all perform very differently. And so we'll talk a little bit about non-scarring alopecia. Those are the types, that is the type of hair loss where typically where people will experience some shedding. Um, you can have them as related to medication. A lot of blood pressure medications will do this. You can have this if it relates to any kind of autoimmune condition. People who have thyroid problems may have this. People who are on chronic prednisone, like transplant patients can have hair loss as well. Hair becomes very thin and fragile. Mm -hmm. There are several that are related to stress. One is called alopecia areata. That's typically where you get these little round patches of hair loss. A lot of times men will have it in the beard, women and children, and everyone will have it on the scalp as well, but absolutely associated with stress. We tend to see that particular type more commonly in people who also may have eczema or hay fever, seasonal allergies. Very, very, very commonly is a non-scarring alopecia called telogen effluvium. And that is 100% stress associated. And it is very classic and predictable three months after a stressful event. And so that's why I mentioned three months after everyone got sent home from COVID, the world shut down. That is when your body started really experiencing it. So hair is not real time right? We can look at a rash, we can look at your heartbeat, we can check your blood pressure, that is real time. Hair okay. related issues are three months behind. So they lag behind okay. three months. And so when we talk to people about what's going on with their hair, it's not in this moment. We're like, what was going on with you three months ago? 
And so that's where you get the story. And so most classically with telogen effluvium, it will be like a woman will deliver a baby. Three months later, she has a lot of hair shedding. If you have any kind of major stressor in your life, you have a heart attack, you move across country for a new job, death, divorce, any of those things, three months later, you will have shedding for about five months and then it resets. The problem is that we don't live in a box. And so one stress often triggers another stress. So we can have, for example, your grandmother got sick. She gets sick, wait three months, hair falls out. Then she went to the hospital, wait three months, hair falls out for five months. Then she passes, wait three months, and hair falls out for another five months. So this can become what we call chronic telogen effluvium, where it's just nonstop. And that is where we are right now with COVID. It's been a year and a half. And so yeah. people are like, what is going on? And all of our dermatology patients have really been on the struggle bus. Struggle bus. Uh, wow. Well, well, that explains a lot in terms of just, you know, stress and, and that, that lag, right? So you say, okay, well, I'm stressed out. But in that, and so people say my hair is falling out. Well, that's later on. But they may not attribute it to the stressor that happened three months prior. They just think that their hair is falling out. Um, so it could be that there's a non-linear kind of connection that, you know, there's a disconnect in terms of connecting what's happening. So yeah, COVID has probably increased your business, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> in and COVID itself, right? So people yeah. who have had COVID, you know, that is a stressor that's a major illness. So after right. they, their recuperation is lengthy. So that can also be associated with um, chronic telogen effluvium too. So with, you know, so we know as, as black people in this country, there is this kind of this daily stressor that happens in terms of like what happens if, you know, a police officer gets behind you. We've got these microaggressions that happen at work. You know, all, all of these kind of subtle things that happen just day to day. Um, I don't want to say racism, but just day to day reminders of, of this kind of black existence in this country. Is that a contributing factor? Could that be kind of a prolonged, which is why you see a lot of, you know, especially men uh, <laughs> have, uh, experience hair loss in their lifetime? Yeah, you know, it's, I, I always tell patients, because some, you know, I have a lot of patients come in and they're like, well, I'm not stressed. And then we start drilling down on what's really going on with their life. And I think particularly brown people right. have become so accustomed to these microaggressions that it, you have to learn how to survive. We're in survival mode all the time. And then you add COVID and then you add whatever else is going on in your life. And so you have just become numb really to the level of stress in your body because you're just trying to survive it. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That, that means, you know, yeah, you have decided that this is not your level of stress, right? right. You have reset. So it's not, not no longer level 10, which it would be for somebody else. For now, for you, it's a level two. Right. And, but it's still stressful. And it really is, you know, I, when you were mentioning earlier, the other topics that you've talked about, this goes hand in hand with increased risk of high blood pressure, stroke, poorly, contri di poorly controlled diabetes, check, 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 check. It is right. all exacerbated by stress. Okay. So what about those people? Like, like my grandfather, when he passed away, he had a full head of hair. Both of them did, you know, and my father is over 70, full head of hair, barely has any gray. And then I'm like, well, what happened to me? Like, <laughs> it's so, so I think, is it generational? What role does family history play into it? Is it just, you know, is it just enough stress or, or maybe do I have more stress? And I think my, my father and grandfather grew up in more stressful times than I did. So, you know, is there a family history or, or is there something else that, that can have someone even in a, a lot of stressors maintain and keep a full head of hair? Yeah. So that is yet another lane for non-scarring alopecia, right? So we talked right. about telogen effluvium, alopecia areata. There's lots of other lanes. I mean, in our dermatology textbook, when we study for our boards, lots of small fine print of all the reasons that you can have non-scarring alopecia. Okay. And so to your point, pattern alopecia, which is what we call the genetic predisposition. You know, we used to call it male pattern, female pattern. Right. It's it's all pattern, right? So, <laughs> so if you go to your um, 
your family reunion and you look around and you see some people who have shiny tops, like <laughs> you know, those are your people, right? right? And so you can always get an indication. I always tell patients, study your next generation and your elders because that's where you're going. And so, <laughs> you know, you can either get on board and try and do some corrective measures now, but the, the horse has left the barn and that's where you're headed. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about those those corrective measures. Are there something? Because I like I, I'm not going to lie. So I'm gonna, I'm going to be fully transparent here. When my hair started thinning in my 30s, I had this this whole kind of stressful crisis, and maybe that probably you know increased <laughs> increased the, the hair loss as I started stressing about hair loss. So I did the, the coconut oil. I did the, the over the counter medications. Finasteride was one of those ones. I I did. Um, the shampoos, you know, this hair kind of thickening shampoo. I did all of that, all of that stuff. Even talked to a consultation about getting some hormone shots into my scalp. You know, what are some effective treatments that people can actually engage in if they really want to keep their hair? Yeah. So, you know, hair loss, and this is not at all to minimize um, how people feel because it really is devastating for a lot of people. And so, you know, what you were going through is dead on, right? It, it changes people. And so I would say first and foremost, don't wait, right? So as soon as you right. see things start to happen, address it. If you are 20 years old and your father is 45 years old and he is thinning, well, guess what? You know, something, it's starting now. Right. I have two nephews and their father is bald and I sat them down, you know, when they were in their early 20s. I'm like, look, aren't you lucky you're related to me? Cause I got stuff, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, you need to take an, take an, I would just say, take the first step. Now with that said, you know, I think as we look at you, you look great, right? Oh, you thank great. You. You've, you've <laughs> embraced it because sometimes you're fighting a battle where you're swimming upstream with a teaspoon, right? Yeah. And so, right. so Sometimes there is like, do I really want to put all this time, effort, finances into looking a certain way, or am I going to shift my mindset? Right. So, you know, men are able to make that decision a lot more easily than women are. Right. right. And, you know, I think, um, you know, number one, you want to get started early. Number two, you really want to research the treatment options, because quite frankly, you know, when patients come in and they bring me bags and bags and bags of stuff that they've gotten on the internet that their aunt Sally told them to use, you know, right. you know, it has to be scientifically driven and it has to work for certain things. So not every treatment works for every type of alopecia. So that's why it's mm -hmm. really important to make sure you have a proper diagnosis. All hair loss is not created equal. So that is, you know, two different scarring, non-scarring, all the different types. So, you know, if you just had gastric bypass and you've lost a hundred pounds and you have telogen effluvium because of nutritional deficiencies, okay, well, let's regroup on your vitamins and get that straight and you should be fine. If you are on chemotherapy and you've lost your hair due to chemotherapy, that will likely resolve once, so you don't really have to do much. You just need to finish with your treatment, right? right. If you have a thyroid problem, you need to get your thyroid problem addressed and that should take care of it. And so you really have to find, connect, get the right diagnosis so you can get the proper treatments. Minoxidil, which is now over the counter, it's something very commonly used for pattern hair loss it is not going to work for other types of hair loss. And so when patients say, well, I've tried this, I've tried this and it's not working, it's not working. I'm like, well, let's go back to square one. What do you have? This was never going to work. So right. let's right. match up the treatment with the diagnosis. And so that's where I think it's very important that you find a board certified dermatologist so that you can be evaluated. Sometimes it's a blood draw, sometimes it's a biopsy, but just to make sure that we get the proper diagnosis get you on the right treatment plan, plan so we can have the most chance of success. Okay, so it sounds like the, the best way is to first go seek uh, consultation with a dermatologist. And so you can get the right type of alopecia diagnosed because it could be scarring, it could be non-scarring. And then even on, underneath those large umbrellas, there's multiple ways that it could be. And so if you can kind of get as close to what it is, then you can kind of figure out if that treatment whether it's over the counter or medication, it can be most effective for you. Does that sound about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, okay. we didn't really talk about scarring alopecia, but I will talk about that for a minute because scarring okay. alopecia 
disproportionately affects African American women. Okay. And that is devastating when I see patients come in that have been hiding their hair loss. And so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, as soon as you see something, do something. Right. right. So that's too with the hairstylist. We want to educate our hairstylists because they're looking at the top of your head. And I think sometimes I've had patients who blame their hairstylist for their hair loss. And that's not the case. It's, you know, if it's scarring, mm. right. So, so there are definitely some things that will make it worse, but your hairstylist is the one who's looking at the top of your scalp, who can see if it's red, can see if there's bumps, can see if you're tender. None of those things are normal. It is not normal for you to have an itchy scalp. It is not normal for you to have bumps on your head. It is not normal for your scalp to be red. And so when you play it off, you're like, oh, you know, that's just the way it's supposed to be. No, it's not. Those are all signs of inflammation. Chronic inflammation is the root of all disease, regardless yes. of where it is on your body. <laughs> yes. And so if your hair follicles are chronically inflamed, that is going to turn into scarring. That means your hair follicles are gone. Hair follicles are a limited resource. They do not regenerate. We don't get more. We are born with 100,000 hair follicles on our head. That's it. And so when our hair follicles die, when they get scarred down, we have to bid those goodbye, right? So we then focus on trying to make sure that the process does not continue and damage the residual hair follicles that we have. Okay. Wow. All right. So, so what are those things it, that, that women might be doing that I've seen the, the glues the, I mean, is it the, the, the pullback hairstyles? What are some things that, that women or even men could be doing that could be damaging their hair and their hair follicles? Yeah, this is such a large conversation, right? Because <laughs> They're doing things, but then why are we doing things, right? So, right. you know, there is the, I feel like I need to look a certain way to have a certain profession. So I need to be acceptable, like, you know, who defines acceptable. Um, we were feeling that, you know, I really want to have straight hair and grow it long. And so then we do the weaves or the braids or, you know, and, and really what it comes down to, and I, I will share, I, I, I am this honest and this straightforward with my Caucasian patients who like to tan, right? right? I tell them, if you were meant to be brown, you would have been born that way. When you buck mother nature, mother nature's going to buck back at some point. It's going to be a skin cancer, right? right? Right. If you were meant to have straight hair, you would have been born with it. And so when you continually process your hair, that's not the way that your body intends to keep hair on your head. So at okay. some point there's going to be a problem. And so about a year and a half ago, there was a gene that was discovered, which is associated with a particular type of alopecia called cicatricial scarring alopecia, which we see again, disproportionately in African American men and women who process their hair, but predominantly women. And so we know that there's a gene associated with this. And what typically pushes things over the edge where you start to see symptoms is chemical processing. Okay. And so now that we have the gene associated, and I tell my patients who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, especially the ones who are still of childbearing age, this is now the conversation that you need to have with your daughters, right? You okay. have the gene. They will likely also have the gene. So you need to engage with your child. She should never perm her hair. She should never process her hair because okay. gene plus overprocessing can trigger scarring alopecia. We know that. So, you know, so all, all those women in the 80s that got them jerry curls that didn't know. <laughs> and the men. And the men. And men. You're right, because you're right, because Ice Cube and, and all of them had the curls too. <laughs> so, um, so, all of that, it, and they may not, they, I'm sure they didn't know if they had the gene or not, could lead to later hair loss it, because of that combination, especially in that heavily chemical kind of era. Uh, of of hair, you know, processing. Um, what about like the, the the grease or anything that we use to kind of that are supposed to be kind of conditioning our scalps and, and trying to uh, stimulate hair growth? Growth is it having the opposite effect? Well, 
Look, I am not trying to diss anybody's grandmother, right? So we're not. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going down that road. But um, the reality is, is again, we have to think about what is it that we're doing and what is it that we're hoping to achieve. So, and I will tell you too, that the, there are, some people are very hung up on hair length. Like I want hair down my back. Right. Every hair has a growth cycle. And that growth cycle varies depending on where that hair is on your body. So the reason your eyelashes don't reach down to your chin is because your eyelash hairs have a very short growth cycle. Right. People's scalp hair, those, you know, Loretta Lynn or whoever that country singer was who had hair all the way down really to the ground, mm-hmm. she clearly has a long growth cycle. Typically the, the growth cycle is anywhere from three months to three years. And so some people, have a very short growth cycle. So they will never be able to achieve hair that comes past their ears or past their shoulders. It's just not in the cards for them. And some people have a longer growth cycle, so they're able to grow their hair a little bit longer. So, you know, it it always comes back to embrace what God gave you. (laughs) And, you know, sometimes we just have to reset our minds because, we can want, we can always want what we want. Like I want to be five foot eight. I'm not, I never will be. <laughs> so I'm here at five, five and I have accepted that. But, you know, it's, it's you, you end up spinning your tail and spending a lot of energy and damage trying to be and do things that you were never intended to be or do. And that includes hairstyling as well. And so, you know, particularly for women, there are now, there's now the Crown Act, which um, is co-founded by Dove, which means that it's, it's the purpose is to end hair discrimination in the workplace, right? Okay. So yes. That, yeah. So if you are feeling that you need to look a certain way, or you have been told that your braids or your locks or whatever are inappropriate, then that's now illegal in many states, soon to be all of them, hopefully. So, you know, so we just really have to rethink why we're doing things to our hair to the point that we're not damaging them. It's a big conversation. It's a big one. It it is. And it's like, it's, it's so depressing. I mean, not not in a bad way, but just in, you start thinking about like, you know, growing up, it was, it was, uh, you know, of course we had the the term, the creamy crack and they had that, that perm and all of those perms and and that the damage that could be done from that. I remember sitting, you know, sitting and have your, your mother part your hair and put all that thick, you know, blue magic and all those different things onto your scalp, which may or may not have been good, but just learning, you know, and, and understanding that you only got a hundred thousand hair follicles, right? And then burning your ears with a hot comb on Sunday night before <laughs> the hot comb, right? On the stove, like just burn it and this house smelling like eggs. I think that's what it was always smell like burnt. You know, I was like, you had that hot comb and, and so the, you know, Brenda put it in the in the cup and said, you're burning the hair with pressing combs and completely damaging your root, right? And so there is definitely um some things that we have done, some practices, but you're right, some of it is just kind of part of our legacy here in this country and how we how attractiveness is associated, right? And so, you know, we see that one type of, you know, crown or hairstyle or hair type being considered the most attractive in this country. And so therefore we go to great lengths to get it and and that could be damaging our hair. And so I I think, you know, what what we're learning now that we know better, we should do better. Uh, And we've got got to continue to learn more. Um, And it's good to work with your dermatologist as well as your stylist to um, come with the best style for you uh, that's going to be most protective for you and your hair. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that doesn't mean that perms are bad. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You know, so I am always of the belief, you know, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. So <laughs> right. you are in my office because you have hair loss and you are still getting perms and just scarring hair. We have, we got a little come to Jesus meeting. Really, right. because we need to correct that and you need to stop doing that. And if there are barriers to you're not wanting to stop perming, we got to talk about that, too. And I always listen to 
the language that patients use when they describe themselves and their hair, because that is very telling. And, okay. you know, I still have patients who come in saying that they don't have good hair. I'm like, okay. Okay. Right. okay. So right. good hair is on your head, bad hair is on the floor. Uh, say that again for the people in the back, Doc. Say that again for the people in the back. <laughs> and, you know, especially if you are around little children and, you know, teenagers, they're listening. And this yeah. is where they learn how to feel about themselves. And so there's such an overlap between dermatology and self-esteem. And I mean, we see it every single day. So it is not really just about, you know, fixing the pimple or whatever, you right. know. Skin is our largest, largest organ, so we actually are the most important doctors, by the way. <laughs> it's the largest organ, you know? You start it is, to, it yeah, is. It's eight it miles, is. eight miles of skin. So, you know, and it really is a window to what's going on. And so dermatologists, um, you know, we can see the significant, the signs of, of kidney disease or liver disease or thyroid problems, autoimmune, it shows up on your skin. And so I, I send patients all the time to go ahead and get the diagnosis of lupus because I know you have it. So let's go ahead and get it done and right. then treat it. So we got a couple of questions about hair loss. So, um, you know, Lillian is saying, please address hyperthyroid and how it affects the growth of the hair texture. Does that does hyperthyroid have a uh, impact on on the growth and hair texture? Yeah, so more more shedding, right? So okay. thyroid is a non scarring type of hair loss, and so it is very common that the hair may be shedding. A lot of people may not notice the shedding. What they may do is look up in the mirror and like, oh god, my hair is like thinner, and you know that is not even often in isolation. So, you know, if this is happening in your 30s and 40s, early 50s, that is also likely correlated with your hormonal shift. And okay. so, you know, again, I have yet to see the hair loss patient where it's just one diagnosis. So usually people come in and like, okay, you got pattern hair loss, you got telogen effluvium, you got, you know, check, check, check. And right. so, you know, that's why, again, it's important to get the full story. Let's see what medications you're on. Let's how long you've been on it. Because a lot of medicines, you know, if you look at the insert on medication packages, it's always says hair loss. Right. It always says hair loss. And that can be true over time, but the biggies are chronic prednisone um, will cause your hair to be very brittle. Okay. Um, and, you know, any kind of chemotherapeutic agent as well. So, you know, in answer to her question, thyroid disease, yes, and we don't cure thyroid disease. And so, you know, I think it's important to make sure that your thyroid levels are always in good shape. I mean, thyroid, as we know, is sneaky disease. It's the symptoms are very, very subtle and you can blow them off to just, you know, I'm tired, it's COVID, I ate more cake, I'm not losing weight, you know, but you got to get your thyroid checked. Okay, we've got another question here from, from uh, Valerie and she's asking basically, when menopause happens, what type of shift should they be doing? Because I know there, there's a hormonal change which could impact hair growth, length, you know, all that stuff. Uh, should they be doing some changes in, in their hair care to offset some of those changes? Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, menopause, regardless of how you achieve it, if it's a surgical menopause, if it's, um, you know, age related um, or chemical menopause because of chemotherapy, um, you have less estrogen, estrogen protective for everything, for your skin, for your hair, for your hearts, for your bones, all of it. And so the conversation about how you're going to manage your menopause, menopausal symptoms, it's a big conversation as well. And a lot of that depends on your risk factors. And so that's certainly something that you want to chat with your primary care doctor or your, or your OBGYN about whether or not you're going to take any kind of hormonal supplements or, or replacement therapy. Okay. Those patients who do that, they tend to have less of an issue, but, but menopause affects people very differently. If you are having hair thinning, which is very, very common, then I would say at least start with the over-the-counter minoxidil. It used to be a prescription, but that's the FDA approval for it. It's for okay. age-related hair loss. And so the thing that Again, we talked about the time frame of hair loss is three months. And so I tell right. my patients, we always talk about threes, right? So 
if you tell me that you've used minoxidil for two weeks and it's not working, what are you expecting it to do in two weeks? <laughs> right. Nothing, right? So go back and come back in three months. It works in three months. So, okay. and the other thing with hair loss is a lot of times I have to explain to people, we are not going to get you back to baseline, right? We, we can't tell right. you as a 55 year old woman who is peri postmenopausal and make you have that full lush head of hair that you had when you were 18. We can't do right. that, but I mean, we can, but, but not really. So, right. so, so, you know, getting started, the, the goal with a lot of hair loss patients is to stop the progression. That's a win, right? right? If we can stop the progression. And so when you ask, is it better? What does that mean? Most people, their better means I want that full head of hair when I was 25. Right. Better means you're no longer losing hair. You're no longer seeing hair in the sink. Okay. That part is no longer wide. Right. So sometimes we have to really, and we do talk about expectations because right. sometimes I really do have to, you know, give people a reality check. We, you waited, you know, you're, you're 50 and you've had hair loss for 10 years and it's not been treated. So it took you 10 years to get this way. Why are you thinking it's going to be better in two weeks? It's a good point. It's a good point. <sighs> boy, boy, boy. I'm just, <laughs> so um, there's that key word. There's a key word you said uh, that's been, consistent through all of these operational lives that we're doing. And we're talking to Dr. Brooke Jackson, who's a dermatologist about hair loss and other skin related conditions here, inflammation. And so inflammation is a bad word, whether it's in your body, in your skin, or inflammation is bad. And so there are multiple ways to reduce inflammation. There's multiple uh, natural ways as well to reduce inflammation. There's an inflammation reducing foods. Um, so you got to reduce stress. Uh, Eat well, get your rest, um, and exercise. And so those things right there will really help reduce inflammation in your body, overall your body. Now, I heard you say something. You snuck something by me. And did I hear you say the skin is eight miles? If you stretch it out, yeah. Yeah. If we were to skin you, take all your skin out and lay it out, um, it's about eight miles. Long. <laughs> A lot of skin cells. A lot. We're the biggest organ. So, all right. So we're, we're going to talk about the skin cells that people care about the most. So that's the skin cells on the face, right? Because that's that's where we typically find our most, we, we spend most of our energy here on this area. Um, and then lotion for a little ash. You know, we got to get got to get some lotion, cocoa butter. You know how we do it, aloe. But I, I think, um, so, you know, when you're hitting that puberty change, why does that? I went from having this smooth baby face when I was a kid to I woke up one day and I had a mountain range on my forehead. Why does that happen? Why does that process happen um, around puberty? Yeah. So it is different for how, whatever, you, however you wish to refer to them, young women, <laughs> boys, teenagers. Um, it's very different. And so, you know, I have, I have, three teenagers myself okay. right now. And so, and I have a lot of teenage patients. I love teenagers. Um, <laughs> um, but if you look around the class, it's usually the teenage boys that tend to have acne a little bit worse than the teenage girls. Right. That is because of testosterone. Okay. So our skin cells have oil glands. All of the oil glands, sebaceous glands have receptors and testosterone is always more acne prone and so that is acne pre prevent presenting and so that is also why in menopause when you have less estrogen that means your testosterone is unopposed because men and women both have estrogen and testosterone right right so women the estrogen level decreases testosterone levels a little bit high unopposed now with menopause and so that is why i will have a lot of perimenopausal women who are like what is happening now I have hair on my face. I have to shave and I have acne and hair loss. It's a problem. Right. Okay. So it is just a hormonal shift. And so again, making sure that there's a plan, put a plan in place or how you're going to manage menopause, but kind of getting back to you as a teenager, <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, it happens. There's, it, so 
we can't prevent it. You know, one of my biggest aha moments in dermatology is we actually don't cure much. We don't cure acne. We don't cure eczema. We don't, we look at all of these things as chronic processes. Okay. And we manage. So it is very important to me to teach patients about their process so that they will learn how to manage it and they will not be frustrated when there's not an immediate results because there's never going to be an immediate result. And so again, sometimes it is, we have to have a mind shift, mind shift about right. expectation because when you have unrealistic expectations about a treatment, you're not going to do anything but get frustrated. Right. I see this all the time. People bouncing from doctor to doctor to doctor because their medication didn't work in two weeks. I'm like, who said it was going to? I'm like, why would you do that? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. You know, just settle down and you know just like your i tell patients a lot i am your skin coach right yeah. so just like your personal trainer would tell you to get down on the ground and do your sit-ups and you know that beer belly didn't come overnight you got to undo you got to eat right you got to exercise you got to put the work in you will right. see the results of your effort but it's not going to be tomorrow okay so i can't sit down and I can't sit down and do 20 sit-ups and, and and get up with a six pack. It's the same, it's the same thing with, with any type of skin condition or hair loss. It's it's gonna take time and it's a practice, right? You've got to con continue that practice. Cause if you're not washing your face and taking care of your face, guess what? That oil might build up again and you might see some some pimples and and, and whatnot. So is it safe to say that as we get older, especially as men and our testosterone level goes down, we there could be some natural clearing of the skin? Um, that's a great question. And yeah, I'm just thinking through my patients. I don't have that many patients who are male patients who are over a certain age and have acne. Okay. Right? I have a lot of women. Um, but I don't have, I mean, I have a lot of male patients. Right. But when I look at my male patients who are in their 50s and 60s, they're not here for acne. They're here for hair loss. <laughs> they're not here for acne. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, there's a lot of people still asking questions about hair loss. I'm going to ask this question and say, how do you know if your hair follicles are dead? Can they be revived? So I think we've already answered, can it be revived? So once a hair follicle is dead, it cannot be revived. Correct. Now, um, in answer to your question, how do you know? Right. It's not like you can see it, right? It's not like you can walk by a dead person on the street like, oh, you're dead, right? right. So um, I often tell patients with, um, and there's a difference between scarred down hair follicles and miniaturized hair follicles. Okay. So miniaturized hair follicles, that is what happens with pattern hair loss, where the hair follicle becomes finer, finer, finer. And so that's why as people are going through pattern hair loss, the hair becomes thinner, thinner, finer, 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 to the point where you can't even really see it anymore. Okay. With scarring hair loss, and it gets back to the cicatrice of scarring alopecia or lupus, that you have an inflammatory process. If the inflammation is around the hair follicle, and it is not resolved. And so this doesn't mean that just because you have an inflammatory hair loss that you are doomed, okay? Right. What I, I, the take home message here is don't sit in the mirror and look at it, put your dermatologist on speed dial and get an appointment. Okay. As, as with any disease process, the earlier the intervention, the better the result. Okay. And so, you know, if you go and get a weave and you see a little bit of irritation or redness around your edges, well, number one, don't get back, go back to that person and get a weave again, but go see a dermatologist, right? So don't continue to cover it up. And that's where patients will get the weave and the wigs and all this. They're covering it up. I'm like, deal with it because we okay. are only going to progress. And there are treatments, there are lots of treatments now. And so again, the earlier we can intervene, the better the result is going to be. Right, okay, that that makes sense. Um, and so as far as the, the hair loss, dead. You can't see that with the naked eye, right? What you right. can appreciate is thinning hair, but often we will do a biopsy 
and I've had a lot of patients who come in and, you know, they're pretty hopeless and I'm really trying to manage their expectations and we get them going on treatment and I'm pleasantly surprised that they recover. Right. So, you know, it's, it's never too late. I, I, you know, (laughs) I think this, this shine right here is, is, I think it might be too late for that shiny area, but uh, I'm going to take your word for it, Dr. Wilk. I'm going to take your word for it. So um, let's talk about those. So Lillian is asking a question about uh, melasma. Uh, she said, please address melasma, the dark spots on my face as it relates to my hyperthyroid. So I guess hyperthyroid seems to be uh, affecting the skin and the hair. Uh, yeah. So melasma is okay. mostly related to hormones plus sun exposure. Okay. So not so much with thyroid. And so melasma is very common on the face, we can see it's, you know, on the chest and the arms as well. More common in women, although I do have a few men who have it. I have a patient who was in desert storm and he was standing in the desert for years and he ended up having melasma. Um, But with um, melasma, often it's like this mottled patchy discoloration, typically on the cheeks and on the forehead and sometimes on the chin and upper lip. It happens irregardless of skin color. So I certainly have some Caucasian patients who have it as well. Hormones plus sun exposure. Okay. Everybody gets it. And so hormones meaning if you start birth control, if you have a baby, if you're on hormone replacement plus sun exposure. And so a lot of brown people don't wear sunscreen. Hormones plus sun exposure. And so, you know, the number one hard stop for me when I talk to patients who have sun related or sun exacerbated conditions is, are you wearing sunscreen? No. Will you wear sunscreen? If the answer is no, we're done. I'm like, I, that's a, that's a hard stop for me. Right. Because you're never going to get any better until you do your part. You know, I don't have a magic wand. Right. I can tell you what to do. I can guide you, but you got to do it. And so that means you're no longer going to beach laying out. That means you're going to put sunscreen and a hat on when you go outside. That means that you're- and What on- level should we get? Like 50, 75, 100? Like what level? <laughs> it's just a minimum level. Because I've like, I, i I've done it all. I've done the, the, the bare 20 and I've done 100. You know, so, and we have zinc or no zinc. Like there's so yeah. many different options. That's a whole other hour. <laughs> the, the Reader's Digest version of that. <laughs> yes. Give it, give it a quick burst. Yeah. So- um, <laughs> Sunscreen is rated by the FDA. SPF means sun protection factor. That was a Jeopardy question. And so the number only refers to UVB protection. So the damaging rays are UVA, UVB, and now we have blue light. But when you pick up your bottle of sunscreen and it says SPF 30, that 30 only relates to UVB. There is no rating system for UVA. So people have this false sense of security, like, I'm good. No, you're not. You need to make sure that you have something that says broad spectrum because that's the language that says we have UVA protection. Okay. Too. And what that number means, 30. If you were going to go outside and get a sunburn, suntan, redness of your skin in one minute, SPF 30 means you can go out and get the same amount of damage in 30 minutes. Okay. okay. Right. So you have to put on enough and you have to reapply. And that's where most people fail. So on your face, you have to use about a quarter's amount. You have to reapply it every two to three hours. So regardless of who makes it, you need to put on enough because that's what was tested in the lab to garner the SPF 30 rating. So if you're not using enough, you got that bottle and you're only putting on like a little penny size, like, ooh, ooh, look, I put it on. You have an SPF 5 and you wonder why I got a sunburn, right? Okay. It's, you didn't put on enough. You didn't reapply. So that is part of it. Everyone, every day, regardless, even if it's on a cloudy day, the sun still penetrates through cloudy days. So you got to put it on. People who are in the car, I'm not ever in the sun. How'd you get here today? You drove here today, right? You live in Atlanta. I live in North Carolina. So it's very sunny in these places. And if you live in your car, you're driving places, you think about add up your commute time. I got patients who spend 10 hours in their car commuting back and forth to work. That adds up. And so that is sun sun damage. And so it penetrates through your glass too. And so if you love that little cozy window in your kitchen, you know, sun's coming right through. 
Got to put it on every day, every day. Wow. So we could find, you know, whether it's our, so when we're doing our, our normal skin regimen, we should put on something at the end that has some sort of skin protection formula added to it. Even for the car ride, even if we don't work outside, we should, okay, all right. All right, you're making my life harder right now, Doc. I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying. This <laughs> okay. All right. So we are. If, if you're just joining us, we have had a wonderful conversation here with Dr. Brooke Jackson, talking about. We talked about hair loss. People are still asking questions about hair loss. We're talking about skin and understanding that the skin has got that M and M. It can be. It's eight miles, right? So it's it's eight miles long if you stretch it out, and it's the largest. We know it's the largest organ. It's, it's the most important according to dermatologists <laughs> but because it, it it is the marker for other conditions and, and, and we've done shows on on liver uh damage disease and they said that's one of the first markers it's when there's a a graying of the skin that you can know that there's some liver um damage and so the skin is a is a nice kind of conduit to let you know hey something may not be right so we're trying to um, get a get a feel for it. So there's some more serious. We've been talking about kind of uh, all the different levels of hair loss, and 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 so the the best way I could sum that up for everybody is go see your dermatologist, right, and get an understanding of where you are, and then understanding and get a reassessment of where you want to be and what you consider to be good. Yes, we can't go back to I can't go back to to whatever year that was that I had that full head of hair, can't go back to those years, but whatever comfortable, whatever is comfortable for you. Um, and then now we're talking about skin and there are some more serious uh, skin diseases. So I kind of want to talk about those a little bit uh, with a little bit of the time that we have left um, because eczema does, dis does it disproportionately affect? I just assumed it disproportionately affects black and brown people, no? Okay, so it's equal. Yeah, it looks different. I mean, everything in dermatology looks different in brown skin. And so, you know, you have okay. to appreciate and understand that it is going to look different. Um, you know, what I will say with eczema, again, chronic condition, it is often associated with, um, we call people atopics. And so atopic families, and often it is a family, you know, Usually it's associated with people who have hay fever, science problems, seasonal allergies, asthma, eczema. Those are the biggies. And so it doesn't mean that you have all of those things. But if anybody in your family has any of those things, you are predisposed to all of those things. And okay. So people, you know, and you and they may change over your lifetime. Like you may have had eczema. None of these things are cured. Right. So you may right. have had eczema when you were a baby. And then when you're a teenager, you develop sinus problems or asthma. And then later on, you develop seasonal allergies. It's right. all the same process. It just affects a different organ. And so usually, you know, there are some things that will be helpful. Again, we're not curing. We are managing. And so right. often people will have a season that is not their friend. So, you know, whether that's spring or fall, yeah. um, I moved here from Chicago. And so, you know, everything shut down with the snow. I live in North Carolina now. People don't like cold weather. I'm like, cold weather is the best thing for your fall allergies. You want that first frost that shuts it down. Yes. <laughs> so usually my tip is if you have those things, you start sniffling, sneezing with the yellow snow in the spring. Go ahead and start taking your antihistamine. Take it every day for about six weeks. Let that settle down. And then you're kind of doing a preemptive strike. Okay. Um, pollen is awful. So, you know, if you're outdoors a lot, you know, wear a hat. So that's not like falling in your hair and then you get in bed and you're sleeping in that stuff all night. Leave your shoes at the door. Get the carpet out of your house. Avoid things that are spritzed and sprayed. Perfume, fragrance is not your friend. And I have patients who say, um, well, you know, what about that lavender, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, look, ma'am, <laughs> you don't get along with nature. Nature does not get along with you. So why are you putting anything in nature on you? No fragrance for you. People always want the exception. But there's got to be an exception, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what about psoriasis? What What is psoriasis and then... And 
it, what are the treatments for psoriasis? Because we know it, eczema is kind of be, you can have uh, different versions of it because my son has it, right? And now you're just explaining to me, but he has got a very, very mild version of it. Like it's not something that you can typically see. It's just really, you know, dry skin that gets itchy. Um, and so, but that makes sense now because I have seasonal allergies. And so that's kind of in that spectrum that you just talked yeah. about. Your fault. That is, it's my fault, right? <laughs> so, um, so, so psoriasis, so eczema and psoriasis typically are affect different areas. So mm -hmm. we talk about eczema um, affecting primarily what we call the flexor surfaces. So that means the inside. So like the inside of your wrist, the inside of your elbow, like the crease behind your knee, those are the flexor surfaces. So okay. right, this is the opposite. Those are the extensor surfaces. So your elbows, your knees, typically psoriasis. A okay. lot of times it'll affect your scalp as well. But usually, I mean, with psoriasis, um, my, my simplified definition is that our cells take about 30 days. So they're with us. They grow up for 30 days and they fall off as dead skin. Okay. With psoriasis, our skin cells are precocious. <laughs> they just grow up too fast. And when they grow up in 15 days instead of 30 days, they don't know that they're supposed to fall off. So they're just hanging out. You know, oh, okay. you okay. know, they know when they're 30 days old, they're supposed to fall off, but they're just hanging out and they're 15 and the grown. <laughs> like, so okay. what do we have to do for the treatment? We have to shove them off. And so a lot of the treatment is aimed at, I won't say exfoliating, but really kind of pushing those thick plaques off. Okay. They're, they'll, they're not going to fall off on their own. And kind of getting back to back to both eczema and psoriasis, there are things that will trigger or exacerbate. And so, and I've seen this actually a lot recently with some of my um, 30, 40 year old patients who have high blood pressure, okay. beta blockers will make psoriasis worse. Okay. So I have to have a conversation with their cardiologist, like, is there another medication that will manage their blood pressure that is not a beta blocker because that will make your psoriasis worse? And let me just say something for anybody who may be listening who that may be an issue. Do not stop your blood pressure medication. Okay. <laughs> Call your doctor right. and make sure that there is an alternative because if a beta blocker is really the best choice for you, then we manage the psoriasis. But if we can get you off of it, that will be helpful. Other things that make psoriasis, there's always things that trigger, right? Right. So other things that will make psoriasis worse, alcohol, right? So, you know, I've had conversations with patients like, well, how much are you drinking? You know, a glass of wine is fine. And as I tell my kids, there are consequences for everything you do. Right. So if you have to have a glass of wine every day, then you cannot expect that your psoriasis is going to get significantly better. Make a choice, right? Okay. There are consequences. So, you know, there are definitely some foods and I, I've talked to patients almost every day, actually every day, about transitioning to more of a plant-based diet. Hmm. Meat, dairy, dairy is awful for your skin. So if you have to give up one thing, give up dairy. Okay. You know, and patients like, well, I don't have dairy. I'm like, but talk to me, tell me about, walk me through your day. <laughs> like, right. like four cups of coffee with creamer. I'm like, dairy. dairy. <laughs> then I have grilled cheese. Dairy. dairy. Then hamburger, cheeseburger. Was it cheeseburger? Yeah, dairy. Pizza. And then, <laughs> and then I have ice cream. Like, all right, check, check, check. All of it. So, you know, again, if you can give it up, and it doesn't mean you have to do it all at one time, it means little bits and pieces. And so there are two Netflix movies that I send patients home with homework. You know, one of them is called Forks Over Knives, and the other one is Game Changers. And those are two that I think everyone should watch because it really does address a lot of myths about plant-based diet and veganism and, and, and how it really can affect people who have chronic diseases. Well, it's, it's interesting that you said that. And we, we just started a show um, here on, on Black Doctor and it's going to be right after this program, and it's called Veganish, right? With Dr. Monique May, Hi, and, Dr. Monique. <laughs> and she talks about how to eat a more plant-based diet, and so it really because that has been the running thing through all of these programs we've been doing on Operation Life, in terms of what you can do at home in order to either prevent some of these illnesses from happening or to reduce the effects if you have these illnesses, and it's always been the same thing. Eat more of a plant-based diet, 
if not a whole plant-based diet, eat more of a plant-based diet, eat more fruits and vegetables in your diet, exercise, sleep, and try to reduce your stress. Yeah. If you are smoking, stop smoking. And if you're drinking alcohol, reduce it if you can't eliminate it altogether. So those things right there, just those behaviors alone will help reduce inflammation in your body um, and you know, all of those good things that you want to have happen. Uh, now, typically most of us, and if I'm being completely transparent, most of us want to be able to continue to do those things and still have a, a healthy life existence. And it, as, as we get older, it just doesn't work that, that way. So. Everything in moderation, right? And yeah. so it's the 80-20 rule. If you can do it 80% of the time, I call myself plant-based rather than vegan. Right. So right. I don't really like me, but if I decide one day that I want to go have a burger, I'm going to go have a burger and not feel bad about it because I know right. 95% of the time I'm eating plant based. Right. I transitioned my family to plant based and getting them off of milk in the beginning of COVID. I told my children that the cows were in quarantine and they were not making milk. So we had to switch to, to, um, <laughs> to plant based milk. And you know, it, it starts young. It starts, you know, I tell patients too, if it comes out of a package, simply put, because people, you know, there's t- so much thought about what is plant based, what is vegan, what is vegetarian, what is all of it. Right. If it comes out of a package, it is bad. If it comes out of a ground, it is good. Right. Simple. Right. If it, I think uh, I saw on another show, it said, if it rots, it's good. <laughs> okay. That's kind of a, a good. Your rule of thumb. If, if it can rot, if you can put it in a, in a rot, it's probably going to be good. But if you sit it out there on the countertop and it just sits there looking at you, it's probably got a lot of preservatives in it. It's not going to be uh, healthy for you in the long run. And so and we talked about those high fructose corn, syrup, corn syrups and all those things that are definitely detrimental to our body. Well, this is the fact we got to have you back. So I'm just going to go ahead and put that stamp down right now. We have to have you back. Um, and for those of you that have gotten something out of this program, share it. We're going to re-air it tomorrow morning. But also we're going to have Dr. Brooke on on a regular basis. She's going to be a regular contributor because as she told us tonight, the skin is the largest organ. It is eight miles long and it is a clear kind of precursor to something more serious happening in the body. So we have to take care of our skin because that is how we greet people with our smiling faces and all of this. What's going on? So we take care of our skin. Pretty good, you know, shot that the rest of our body is doing well. Um, So thank you, Dr. Brooke. And I will be talking to you all very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.